Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for having me here. This is a beautiful space. On the way here, I was convinced that it was in the Latin American studies. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I was like, wait, I should look this up before I go. So I'm glad I did, because I was going to the wrong place. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, in the most broad sense, this is a talk on how indigenous writers, how native writers have used the idea of the Indian. Mm. So the, fig the figure of the Indian, uh, illusions that people have about what constitutes an Indian, we all understand how this is part, but part of the colonial discourse. But what I'm curious about here is how native writers themselves, native intellectuals, have used this idea. So that's us. So I'm going to read you this talk. It's going to be very exciting. Okay. <laughs> In 1973, news of the uprising at Wounded Knee filtered through indigenous Brazil. Through radio, word of mouth, and community meetings, the news spread. Uh, about the local Lakota and the American Indian Movement's occupation of the town of Wudani on Pine Ridge. Brazil's indigenous peoples drew lessons and inspiration from this event. They reasoned that indigenous challenges to the dominant society drew more attention and perhaps more allies with states' protectability. From that point on, communities resolved to influence governmental policy by bringing to light the oppression they faced through public demonstrations and to draw the media's attention. From tribal people in the north, Brazil's native peoples were stirred into new, a new form of resistance. It's a fascinating thing to me that Amazonian communities drew inspiration from Wounded Knee. Mm -hmm. But the document produced by Brazil's National Indian Foundation, FUNAI, a governmental agency established a few years earlier to advocate more effectively for indigenous people, that summarized the Wounded Knee incident and served as the focal point of discussion for indigenous debates about tactics, reveals a curious understanding of American Indian history. The Oglala Lakota and the American Indian Movement's activists took Wounded Knee, claims the document, because it had been the site where some, quote, 85 years earlier, more than 200 Lakota had been massacred by federal troops under the command of the famous General Custer. That's what the document says. Mm -hmm. There are errors in this claim. Mm -hmm. First, the dates are wrong. Wounded Knee, the Wounded Knee massacre occurred in 1890, 85 years earlier. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, Custer was not involved in the massacre of, of the Lakota at Wounded Knee because he had been killed, <laughs> along with the rest of the 7th Cavalry 14 years earlier at the battle, uh, the battle of Little Bighorn, the famous Custer's Last Stand. So the Funai document is poor historiography, but revealing as a cultural text. Even though it is inaccurate, it displays a clear logic of native resistance that must have made sense to its indigenous audience. The historical Wounded Knee of the document, the Wounded Knee where the Lakota were massacred in 1890, signifies the injustice with which white America has treated Native Americans. General Custer is the embodiment of unjust white power, but he's also famous for having been killed by Native warriors, and therefore also denotes the ability of indigenous peoples to defend themselves effectively against that power. General Custer massacres Lakota, but is in turn killed himself by Indians. The, Fu Dai, the Funai document re rewrites history so that Custer's last stand is the vindication for the massacre of Wounded Knee. It inverts all the history to tell a story of native resistance. Thus, according to this logic, native activists take Wounded Knee in 1973 in order to draw attention to the historical injustice of the massacre and as a continuation of the native resistance responsible for bringing justice to justice men like Custer. We could say that the Funai document is a kind of historical fiction because it fictionalizes American Indian history in order to draw from it a meaningful narrative of native defiance. It, turn, it turns historically real Native people into figures of Indian resistance. And what follows, I'm interested in how Native writers deploy or challenge this figure of the Indian. Specifically, I read Darcy McNichols' Wind from an Enemy Sky in terms of his depiction of indigenous self-determination in Peru. Draw, in drawing connections among Indian movements in different parts of the Americas, as part of what James Cox calls a potentially revolutionary American transnational imaginary, McNichols, I contend, stirs up familiar trouble. I'll conclude with a discussion of Louis Eldridge's Shadow Tag, a novel that portrays the dangers of Native peoples turning each other into abstractions of the Indian, a reduction that transforms actual suffering into what the novel ironically calls the iconic suffering of a people. Okay, so McNichol. Descended from a Métis revolutionary and an enrolled member of the Confederate, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes of Montana, Darcy McNichol was a vital and often visionary public native intellectual. His 1936 novel, The Surrounded, anticipates American Indian activism over a later period, 
by posing that Native people knew what was best for themselves, they should be left alone to decide their own futures. But while this novel is set in a real place among real people, among the Salish Indians on the Flathead Indian Reservation, Wind from an Enemy Sky, published in 1978, a year after his death, invents two Native communities, one in the United States and one in Peru. The novel is an early example of what has sometimes been called the transnational turn in both Native culture and politics at the end of the 20th century. The plot of Wind from an Enemy Sky moves inexorably towards its tragic conclusion. Because of the inability of a tribe called the Little Elk to exercise control over their lives, their lands have been irreparably char uh, changed by a dam built without their consent. And Feather Boy, their sacred medicine bundle, which was given away against the tribe's wishes, is, des is destroyed in a faraway museum. Their rage at, the, at their powerlessness culminates in the novel's violent, violent final scene, in which several of the main characters lie shot to death, and an old medicine man's death song rings out how the world fell apart. I guess I should have said, like, spoiler alert, it ends badly. <laughs> but, but an embedded story in the novel presents a counterexample. It imagines an indigenous community in Peru achieving what the little elk could not, to determine for themselves the ways to adapt to their changing circumstances. The story of the Peruvian Indians is told by Anne Pelt, the character in the story, the architect who built the dam that drowned the little elk's lands and the owner of the museum at which Feather Boy was destroyed. The Indians of Cuno, Peru, a fictional town in the Peruvian Andes, has been oppressed like many other Native communities since the time of the conquest. But Pell's friend Carlos, the scion of an old aristocratic family, uses his wealth and property to help the Comunidad Indígena establish their economic self-sufficiency. Taking advantage of the opportunity Carlos gave them, the Indians of Cuno succeeded they bought more lands and machinery and further improved their economic condition by adopting new ideas, quote from the novel. They remained, however, again the novel, instinctively conservative, which means that these changes did not alter their fundamental understanding of who they were. Even while buying machines, building schools in which to educate their children, and participating in local governance, they never lost their sense of who they were. <clears throat> Eventually, their success allowed them to become integrated into the larger community, thereby healing in the novel's words, the centuries-old traditional division between the two groups. The last act of the Comunidad Indígena as a separate political body was to unite its funds with the rest of the town in order to build a hydropower plant. Embracing this powerful signal of modernity, the same signal that signifies the beginning of the end for the little elk. Later, as Adam Pell anguishes over what, can, what he can do to repair the damage he caused the little elk, he envies what his friend Carlos was able to do. He thinks out loud, quote, Carlos had this advantage. He could give something that had been denied his people, and the gift could make them a whole people, not just the land, though that was essential, but the power to decide things for themselves, to be in control of their own lives, Unquote. To empower Native people to become self-sufficient, that is what Carlos is able to do. Wind from an Enemy Sky suggests that Native people will integrate into American society only when they have the resources to enable them to determine their own fates. This change is that, does not mean Native people will give up their identities, only that they will be able to change in ways that are compatible with their own way of seeing the world. No matter how traditional Native societies might be, this does not suggest that they are unchanging. However, they cannot be forced to change. Changes in Native societies will only be meaningful, sustaining, and productive when they come from the free exercise of Native self-determination. This is perfectly consistent with politics of native self-determination from like the 1950s on. So McNichol invents, so, so McNichol invents Andean Indians in order to imagine meaningful indigenous agency. It creates this imaginary community. Imagines meaningful, uh, ima invents Andean Indians to imagine meaningful indigenous agency. Inventing Indian, Andean Indians, however, is not unique to McNichol. Indeed, throughout the 20th century, imagining the Indio has been a national phenomenon in Peru and lots of other places too, Mexico, etc. In the Hinismo, the discourse created by non-native people to define what Indians are and what they mean is key to understanding Peruvian history. At the beginning of the 20th century, political and economic power was in the hands of white royal elites that considered 
the indigenous, the indigenous racial and cultural elements of the nation as impediments that kept, that kept it, Peru, from full participation in modernity. But the ambitious mestizo class used the figure of the Indian, which they defined through indigenismo, as a powerful symbol for legitimizing their political aspirations. In indigenismo, the subaltern indio stood for the oppressed nation. Indigenistas implored Peruvians to embrace their Indianness and to see themselves as part of the disenfranchised and oppressed masses. Thus, achieving political power was equated in the indigenista mind with liberating the oppressed Indian inside all mestizos. Defining the Indian was for mestizos an act of defining the nation. As a national project, indigenismo transformed what had been an obstacle to modernity into a figure that could articulate alternate paths for Peruvian modernity. Jose Maria Arguelles' 1941 novel, Yawar Fiesta, portrays perhaps the most compelling vision of indigenismo. In the novel, the Ayus, or indigenous, or indigenous communities of the Andean town of Pukio, decide to build a highway to the coast in order to demonstrate their superiority over all the other Andean communities. In Arguelles' telling, the indigenous workers gather at the town square just before they set off to build the road. Beneath a Peruvian flag, the principal leader of the Ayus makes a short speech. He says, Tatay Kuna, ahí está juntos todos en Dios Fucanas. Vamos a abrir carretera a Nazca para 28 Julio. Pukio es mando, Fucana es mando. Eso no más, Tatay Kuna. The laconic principal chief, says that the road will be open for the, Peruvian, for the Peruvian Independence Day on July 28th. What Arguedas has created here is a kind of literal form of indigenous nation building. Indigenous workers under a Peruvian flag in order to commem commemorate the nation construct its infrastructure. In the novel, they do it for the honor and ask for nothing, returning quietly to their subordination and suffering. As the Agua Fiesta shows, the ability of mestizos to define the Indio was reflective of the subaltern position that indigenous people occupied in Peruvian <coughs> society, and it perpetuated it. Native people's definition of themselves and their voicing of their own concerns was drowned out by mestizo claims. The realities of oppression and marginalization and racism that indigenous communities faced at the hands of mestizos were made invisible by the images of the Indio produced by indigenismo. Indigenismo benefited mestizos as a disempowered native people. If we return to McNichol, we see a stark difference between his fictional Andean Indians and those of indigenismo. Indigenismo invented Indians for a political project that had little to do with indigenous, commun indigenous communities and further disenfranchised them. Men McNichol invented Andean Indians in order to imagine self native self-determination that we have. Indigenismo invents Indians in order to benefit mestizos. Here, McNichol is inventing Indians in order to imagine native self-determination, so a very different political project. But while, the, but while his story of indigenous agency is not meant to benefit non-Indians or to suppress the long history of oppression faced by Andean Indians, it does blind us to the fact that representation has been a crucial dimension in the disempowerment of Peru's indigenous communities. That's what we can't see. We can't see in this book how representation has been used to disempower native people. His native fiction about Andean Indians makes it nearly impossible to understand how fictions about Andean Indians have been used to marginalize those communities. His powerful work of imagining Indian self-determination dovetails in unexpected ways with the colonial history of Peru's imaginary Indians. I can't tell if I'm going fast or slow. No, it's happening. Can, right. can everyone hear? And you're yeah. all following well? <laughs> I don't know how long I've been talking, but it's like, uh, no, it's it was great. supposed to be like 20 minutes. I don't know how far, how long it's been. <laughs> okay. You're good. Okay. The depiction of the, okay, so the depiction of the idea of the Indian by Native people is treated tragically in tragically emotional terms in Luis Edridge's shadow text. So now we're transitioning here to shadow text, which is also going to be interested in how Native people use the idea of the Indian. A native family's unraveling hatred permeating every fiber of the parent's life. The children suffering a disaster they see coming but are unable to change. These are the affecting dimensions of a novel that is at the same time committed to understanding 
how representation affects Indian life. The central drama is a growing loathing between Irene America, that's the, the woman's name, Irene America, and her husband, Gil. Gil is a working painter, and Irene is the subject of all his important art. Gil is talented, but cruel and possessive. Irene is intelligent, but resentful and enabling. Their relationship is unequal, as are the family's dynamics. And the power that Gil holds over everyone is figured in terms of the power he wields over his art. His painting of his wife, which in his mind is the same thing as painting all Indians, leads to the family's destruction. <clears throat> Images of Native people, even were they created by Natives themselves, the novel tells us can be destructive. So rather than in what we see in uh, Wood and Miss Sky, we see the Native people producing representations of Native people, this idea of the Indian. In this novel, we have a critique of Native people, again, producing that figure of the Indian. Gil has painted his, his wife during the entire length of their relationship. And as he matured as a painter, he came to understand the symbolic potential of the figure of his wife. This is his words here. He'd been working on a mythic level with her portraits. Her portrayals immediately evoked the problems of exploitation, the indigenous body, the devouring momentum of history. More than that, he'd progressed to a technical level that allowed him an almost limitless authority. In painting his wife, Gill paints what amounts to a form of Indian history. She is a symbol whose body is consumed by narratives that are projected onto her, what Gill calls the mythic level. She is a signifying body and the movement of history. Her form is subsumed to those narratives to the extent that he can, can, that he can control his painterly expression. That is, she can be made to narrate to the level that he can express his almost limitless authority over her. So in painting her, he is, you know, he is um, exercising his authority over her. So the, his painting here is equated essentially to a form of colonial mastery that he's reproducing. He considers his painting of Irene an act of love, even though he often depicted her in a cruel light. But he used her brutalization to declare what to him was a higher truth, he thinks that he used, quote, her humiliation as something larger, as the iconic suffering of a people. Though so that phrase is a, critic, is a critic, and he finds it chokingly reductive, it nonetheless conveys how he understands what his paintings mean. In order to tell his story of Indian suffering, McGill must make his wife into a symbol, and also he must make her suffer, make his wife into a symbol, a meaningful object, really. And in order to do that, he must possess and master her. Irene recognizes the situation, but deals with it in a way that compounds its destructiveness. She writes to Gil in her diary, quote, here is the telling, here is the telling thing. You wish to possess me. And my mistake, I loved you and let you think you could, unquote. He needs to possess her for his art, and she lets him believe that he can possess her while still believing she is free from the power of his depictions. At least that is what she thinks as she first begins to ponder their situation. What power could images hold, she wonders, quote, the image is not the person, she thought, or even the shadow of a person. That's the movie, the novel's called Shadow Tag. Mm -hmm. So how can, a, how can a person be harmed by the depiction, mm -hmm. even appropriation of something as intangible as one's image? But the more she considers it, the more she realizes how much of Gil has actually managed to control by painting her. Her name and her image were now inextricable from Gil's mastery. Quote, Irene America. Her name was now a cipher joined to simulacra. Cipher, a code named to simulacra, an image of an image. So no reality there, a mystery tied to a, a depiction of a depiction, a second order thing and the portraits were everywhere. By remaining still in one position or another for her husband, she had released a double into the world. It was impossible now to withdraw the reflection. Gail owned it, unquote. Here she has answered her earlier question. The image of her created by her husband 
full of his intentions and narratives and mysteries, a cipher has been let loose on the world. Her face and her body in all their poise, po sorry, in all their postures and poses were now made to speak in another tongue, tell someone else's story. Her portrait became a simulacrum, an image of an image, a painting of iconic suffering, and would no longer simply depict her. She might have believed that she let Gil think he possessed her, but through his paintings, he indeed came to own her. Gil's and Irene's relationship is a kind of allegory for the broader issue of the depiction of the idea of the Indian. The novel addresses this directly. Gil and Irene get into one of their comfortable arguments about whether it's possible to depict Native people without invoking the narratives already circulating about them. Irene maintains that Indians as images are kitsch. The image of the Indian is tacky and mass produced and everywhere still, right? everywhere, everywhere. We always see the, there's always some um, you know, dream catchers for sale on Telegraph every weekend. The image of the Indian is tacky and mass produced and everywhere. The Indians cannot reclaim their image, according to Irene. As she puts it, we'll never get the franchise back. Mm -hmm. And although Gil argues against her, his depictions of his wife, not as a person, but as an idea, a myth, and an icon, bear out her argument. What can an image really do? Shadow Tag turns to this question again in its discussion of George Catlin, the great painter of Indians and Western scenes. The depth and shadow of Catlin's painting, says the novel, caused his, in his native subjects and audience wonder and fear. Quote, some, sw some swore uneasily that those who allowed their portraits to be painted, eyes open, would, lie, would not lie peacefully after death as some aspect of their being would live on, staring out at the world." Unquote. Others believe that Catlin's paintings took away the buffalo because the herds seemed to begin to disappear around the time he began to paint them. The novel decides, so it was, so it was, the images stole their subjects and for the rest of the world became more real until it seemed they were the only things left. And here we can think about how that image of the Indian, in particular the image of 19th century Plains Indians is more real to most people than actual contemporary Native people. That figure of the Indian is more meaningful, more realistic, more uh, full of, uh, of content than actual Native people in their, in their present concerns. When not, so when non-Natives depict Indians, says Erdrich, those Natives can take, sorry, those images can take the place of indigenous people. The more images there are of native people, made but not natives, the less power indigenous people have to control how they will be seen and understood. However, by placing the power over Indian representation in the hands of a native artist, Erdrich touches on the problem we saw in Wind from an Enemy Sky. Native people too can contribute images that displace real indigenous peoples in the popular imagination. Mm -hmm. Shadow Tag reminds us that native people are not images, myths, narratives, or icons. They are, human they are human beings that live, love, hate, and suffer. And that we need to be reminded of this to this day is a testament to the power of the idea of the Indian. That's it.